Hi, my name is Shane, and I'm the communication specialist for the Marinia Project and the host of the Marinia Podcast. We're working hard towards starting the world's first floating village at sea located in international waters near the Quezal Bank. In other words, a seastead where humans can finally live free. Free from government regulations, free from the overpopulated population centers, and most importantly, the freedom to be the person you truly want to be. But this project isn't about us. It's about you, and we need freedom pioneers from all over the world to join us as we set sail for sunnier waters. Just imagine a place unhampered by government interference. Revolutionary medical research, flourishing businesses and economies, all of the fresh seafood you can eat, and the best front porch or back patio view known to man. If you're as excited as we are, get involved today and help us bring Marinia into fruition. Visit marinia.org and click the Participate in the Project tab. And while you're there, please peruse all of the great educational material. And make sure to subscribe to the bi-weekly podcast to keep apprised of the progress in cutting-edge seasteading news. Join us as we build the second realm. Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for libertarianism in action. We provide you with real free market solutions using the freedom umbrella of direct action to give you the tools necessary to increase your own personal liberty. As Ludwig von Mises said, liberty is always freedom from the government. And now your host, Shane. All right, and welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the commune state of Illinois, as, as always, or at least most of the time, right? Uh, so this podcast ain't everything found on the website, unless otherwise noted, is covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone, except for governments and the agents thereof. Uh, so yeah, if you don't fall into uh, one of those two categories, uh, and if you're listening to this podcast, you probably shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be, but uh, please do whatever, uh, whatever you wish with, uh, with the content. Mirror it on your blogs, uh, YouTube channels, podcast feeds, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, We definitely uh, encourage it. So this podcast is coming to you a day late, and it's not because I was slacking this week. Uh, Quite to the contrary, actually. But rather, I was interviewed on Kyle Turnblazer's The Liberty Forge podcast, and I didn't want to, uh, you know, release my copy before his went out. I'm sure he wouldn't care, but, uh, but, you know, I I figure I'd just, uh, you know, go ahead and wait an extra day. I think you guys can can probably, uh, I think you guys probably held out okay. Uh, (laughs) So this was the uh, first correspondence uh, him and I have had, and uh, you really need to check out his podcast. He's had uh, terrific guests on, such as Vin Armani, uh, Merrick Van Landingham, and Jamin Baconic, the latter two. Uh, you know, we've, we've uh, definitely had on this podcast before, uh, and also some some other really cool folks. Uh, definitely check out his podcast. Uh, his website is thelibertyforge.com, and you can subscribe on your uh, favorite podcatcher uh, so you don't miss uh, any of his episodes. Nonetheless, I thoroughly enjoyed our, our conversation. Uh, we discussed seasteading, uh, the Marinia Project, Rayo, Vanu, direct action throughout history, and even dove into some more philosophical stuff towards the end. Uh, probably stuff you're, you're sick of hearing from me because I've, you know, rehashed these same things over and over again. But anyways, uh, you, you know, like uh, voting, controlled schizophrenia, and uh, paraphrasing Rayo, strategies on exercising those collectivist spooks from your head. More specifically, two things we discussed were the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action and the Direct Action series. So for our new listeners, the FUDA is a value-free directory of economic means solutions, uh, or direct action. You know, all of those things that you can do to increase your own personal freedom without asking for permission and, uh, you know, without begging government, without begging those who falsely imagine themselves to be our rulers. Uh, So there are about a hundred of them on there right now, and the objective is uh, for that list to serve as a home base of sorts. You know, you you find a few that interest you, uh, you try them out, and if for some reason, you know, something doesn't work, uh, you can always return to the list and try something new. Uh, you can find that at libertyunderattack.com forward slash FUDA. That's F-U-D-A. Secondly, the Direct Action Series. This was the next logical step after coming up with the FUDA. This was a six-plus um, yeah, this was a, a six plus month-long live radio series we did on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network, uh, wherein we interviewed folks who have actually done these things. Uh, for example, Perpetual Traveling with Pete Sisko, 
Agorism with Derek Bros, Free Range Parenting with Lenore Skenazy, Entrepreneurship with Nathan Frazier, and so many more guests. It's kind of endless. <laughs> You can get access to the 40 plus hours of content for free by visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash freedom now. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash freedom now. So before I turn you over to the interview, I would love to get your feedback on ideas for reformatting the show. Of course, the focus will still be direct action. That's not going to change. But uh, it's been almost a year of the podcast and it's time for a change. Uh, I've, I know for, for some of the podcasts I listen to when they, you know, keep it fresh, you know, I, I enjoy that and I've been, I guess I have been slacking on this part because I've been talking about it for, I guess I've been planning on doing it for like four or five months, uh, but, uh, struggling a little bit, struggling a little bit, uh, and also busy doing other things, but, uh, yeah, so expect a new show intro at some point. I know I've been promising that, but, uh, you know, it will, come, it will, it will, it will come out, it will come out. And, uh, then also, you know, uh, some new segments. So let's talk about those, uh, for, uh, for a moment here. So. I'm thinking about adding a couple of those segments, uh, maybe bringing back fascist book news uh, and adding something called direct action of the week or a title along those lines. So for those who listen to us uh, on the live on live radio at uh, on the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network, uh, you heard the uh, fascist book news segment premiered there. And uh, basically what we'll be doing this segment is uh, go through the, uh, I guess, the, the top stories on fascist book and, uh, you know, the things that are most important to your fellow human beings, you know, uh, and freedom doesn't ever come up, <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, but uh, we, we just kind of go through those and, and make fun of it. Uh, we make fun of the carnival of carnivores known as the news cycle and, uh, you know, don't give any credence to it. Don't give any credence to it whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly considering bringing that back, I've been wanting to, or maybe doing some, maybe, you know, bring it back for some other purpose, but hell, why not, uh, you know, bring it back as, as one of those segments. So for the other one, uh, direct action of the week, or at least, uh, you know, that's a tentative title. Um, I would, it would consist of me keeping my eyes out for folks doing incredible things in pursuance of their personal freedom, uh, or, you know, in some cases, probably highlighting some new tool or service uh, that could be of use to you in your search for said freedom. Uh, so those are the two that I have in mind right now. Um, obviously, I'm more than open to suggestions. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on, what, uh, on, on those two segments so far. Um, and, you know, anything else you'd like to hear from uh, Liberty Under Attack. So, yeah, please let me know. Uh, you can private message me on Fascist Book. You can message the LUA Fascist Book page. Uh, you can email me, Shane at LibertyUnderAttack.com, uh, or whatever or whatever uh, other method you want to uh, contact me through, Signal, Telegram, whatever. I don't really care. Um, but uh, I think that's all I have for you right now. Please enjoy my interview with Kyle on the Liberty Forge podcast. Laissez-faire. Shane. Yep. What is going on, man? Not a whole lot. How, how are you? How's, how's it going? Oh, man, it's another day above ground. I'm out here making a dollar. I'm not going to complain too much. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people, some, some people are struggling to find jobs. So, you know, uh, to have to have one is, uh, uh, you know, even if it is within the state of survival society, then uh, then, you know, that's still good. Still good. Got to survive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through regulation sometimes and God knows my industry's thick with it. But but, man, I know you're a busy man. I do appreciate you uh, taking the time out to talk to us today. Hey, not a problem. I appreciate the uh, the invitation to come on and, and chat with you. Sure thing, man. How many podcasts do you do? It's a good question. It's a good question. So, <laughs> so I'll start with the, the oldest one first, uh, which would be Liberty Under Attack Radio, uh, which I started in February of 2015. So we're coming up on on three years of doing that. Switch to uh, the switch to doing a podcast for it uh, in October of 2016. And uh, over there, uh, you know, since uh, I guess kind of since, you know, after the first six months uh, we're on there, I guess that when we start when I started out uh, uh, with LUA Radio is very conspiratorial. And after about, you know, three or four months, it kind of shifted drastically to anarchism uh, and uh, direct action and solutions. Uh, but uh, you also find, you know, uh, just, uh, I guess, scattered throughout, uh, you know, discussions on, uh, I guess, philosophical subjects. Uh, and uh, economics. But generally uh, over there, we talk about uh, uh, direct action. Uh, so that would be uh, libertyunderattack.com. And then uh, the next one, uh, the Vani podcast, uh, which we'll get into, uh, I guess, pretty heavily here uh, coming up. Uh, but that podcast is kind of centered around a guy named Rayo and a uh, freedom strategy he developed, uh, largely developed, uh, called Vanu. Uh, and that's over at vanupodcast.com. And Vanu is V as in victory, O and as in Nancy U, vanupodcast.com. Uh, and then the last one uh, is actually most recent, uh, the most recent, uh, the Marinia podcast. 
uh, which is uh, my the the only paid po- I guess the only I guess regularly paid podcast I do uh, for the Marinia Project, a seasteading venture. Uh, they're hoping to uh, start a village at sea in, in international waters. Uh, so uh, he wants uh, somewhere without government. I mean, he doesn't really get more free than the open ocean. Uh, so I do their podcast for him. I'm the, I'm, my official title is communication specialist. Uh, so I handle, you know, all the public relations sort of stuff uh, over there. So right now I do I do three podcasts, uh, but the Marinia one is uh, is biweekly. So seasteading, huh? Yeah, yeah, seasteading. Man, that sounds awesome. And uh, unlike the excitement that I hear in your voice, you know, I've heard of it, but I, I'm not too keen on it. I don't know exactly what it, I, I imagine it's like uh, those kids in the 70s with pirate radio, right? Uh, that's I get that is that is one application of it uh, until uh, there was an international treaty that was uh, that was signed that uh, you know banned uh, you know broadcasting radio from the ocean. Uh, uh-huh. But uh, yeah, yeah, you gotta love those uh, you know those international you know regulations and such. Uh huh. Um, but uh, but yeah, seasteading is uh, you know very it, it's it's gonna be the next step. It's 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 inevitable. I mean uh, you know if you consider seventy percent of the earth is water. And uh, uh, and you you consider how you know in the past you know 50 years at least maybe 60 years uh, people have been corralled into cities and uh, I, some people argue it's overpopulate overpopulation but uh, you know I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case uh, but regardless I mean uh, uh, you you consider that 99.9 percent of all land uh, in the world even kind of the most obscure uh, uninhabited ocean islands uh, you know gov- some government claims jurisdiction over that. Uh, whereas right. with the open ocean, uh, you're you're kind of it's just kind of the international there's the international law of the sea or something like that, and uh, you do have to uh, you know flag out of some you know country's port uh, or else you'll be considered a pirate. Uh, but you can find uh, you know a country that just wants the the yearly fee uh, that doesn't really have any you know additional laws upon uh, the international law of the sea. So you want to talk about uh, yeah like I said you want to talk about uh, no government pretty much. Uh, you know that's that's kind of uh, you know the 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 most uh, beneficial option, but there are a lot of hurdles to be overcome, uh, and <laughs> uh, and and I guess it'll be interesting to see what happens because uh, Marinia the Marinia project uh, they're going to do it in international waters, and uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Seasteading Institute. Uh, they actually got a hosting nation, uh, French Polynesia. So they're two completely different approaches: one in international waters and one working with an established uh, you know country. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens, but I, I really do, you know, see, you know, seasteading being uh, kind of the next logical step in human freedom. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, you know, I think that's kind of the the stepping stone to uh, space steading too. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I I I think seasteading is a very interesting venture. Uh, I've got some concerns with it uh, from looking at you know a bunch of case studies from the 60s and 70s. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a uh, you know you know maybe now's the time when it can when it can actually happen. So we'll just, we'll just have to see. Yeah, and your your concern is that is that more like sustainability or maybe um, maybe governments interfering with you or maybe barriers to actually get it done? But what, what what kind of hurdles are you looking at there, man? Yeah, so and the the first one is has kind of been the issue all along. It's uh, you know recruiting people. You know, uh, kind of like the the Free State Project. You know, they they it took them a long time to get the twenty thousand signers, and not all of those people have have even moved there yet. Uh, so the first initial hurdle is you know trying to get people to actually move there uh, to the seastead. Uh, the second one would would kind of be the funding. Uh, the Marinia project for phase one, uh, and the Marinia project is, you know, very, very realistic plan compared to some I've seen in the past. Uh, but they're looking for 15 million for the first phase, and uh, what they're going to do, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, it's called a, uh, it's a barge, and it's been, you know, uh, uh, accommodated or I guess uh, modified. Uh, it's a very luxurious kind of hotel. Uh, so they want to get that and get out there on the water and start testing out, uh, you know, the the infrastructure uh, and the technology, which the technology is not really a hurdle. Uh, in all honesty, um, but uh, you know, getting people out there, the funding, and then the final one would be, yeah, governments, governments. Uh, so it's it's good that they're in international waters, uh, but at the same time, you know, governments, uh, <laughs> it's silly to uh, you know trust governments to follow their own laws, because uh, you know there were case studies in the uh, yeah 60s and 70s where they were in international waters and what they were doing was completely legal, but uh, you know they they didn't have uh, you know it's a, it'd be a new country. Uh, so they didn't have really any defense. So you know, it take, took like one gunboat to uh, take out the folks uh, there in uh, Operation Minerva. I'm pretty sure was what it was. 
<clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, you can't really trust governments to follow their own laws. And I don't know what their reaction is going to be uh, to seasteading. I don't think they're going to like it too much. Uh, I don't think they're going to. Uh, but we'll just and see if it, maybe maybe it's kind of changed a little bit uh, since the 60s and 70s. But that's kind of my biggest uh, biggest concern is uh, <laughs> you have to get all that money poured into it. And uh, then, you know, some government comes and shuts it down. Uh, so Marini is better off, uh, better off. Uh, it's going to be a floating village. Uh, so we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, the within the 200, the exclusive economic zone, which is out to uh, 200, around 230 miles off the coast of any established nation. Uh, that'd be, you know, the seafloor, any, you know, uh, uh, atolls, lagoons, any sort of land uh, or oil or uh, any minerals on the ocean floor. Um, but uh, so, so, yeah, it'll be a floating village. So that's good. We don't really have to worry about that. But again, you can't really trust governments to follow their own laws. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of the concern uh, that, that, that I have. But uh, I think it's uh, I think it's manageable. Yeah, it's not reassuring at all to know that uh, their drones keep getting fancier and fancier every year. Right, right. <laughs> and it's not like uh, and it's not like, uh, you know, maybe in the 60s and 70s, if you kept it under wraps, uh, you know, maybe they wouldn't be able to find out what you're doing out there. But I don't think it's taken more than, you know, a couple few weeks to, to find you. Uh, if you do, if you start doing anything significant out there on the water, uh, they're going to know pretty quick, I think. So I don't think there's yeah. any way to really do it under the radar. Well, that's freedoming without buying all the permits, man. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they don't like that. <laughs> no, 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 they, they, they don't. And, and, and the... I guess the, the ramifications, you know, that that could come to, you know, nation states if seasteading takes off. It's not really an if, it's a when. Uh, but the, the ramifications that could come to nation states when this happens uh, are so drastic. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the main, I guess, advantages that a lot of seasteaders are talking about is it would really set up, uh, you know, competing governments. Uh, you know, governments actually have to work to keep you there because if you, I mean, if you don't, you just kind of, you know, detach your boat and float on somewhere else. Uh, so that it's, it's not like land where you're kind of stuck. Uh, you, you can definitely get away, but I, I'm looking more forward, more forward to kind of the uh, the no government setup. Uh, but unfortunately, I haven't seen a seasteading project yet uh, that was anarchist based. There's always governments involved, uh, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that has to do with you know trying to get uh, uh, your nation recognized. You got to have a government to do that. So I think that's kind of what one of the mm -hmm. baseline sort of things, uh, which is why I prefer I, I prefer the minimal seal boating approach because you don't have to deal with uh, you know all of that uh, status nonsense. You just kind of uh, you get a boat and go do it. Uh, but I do I do think seasteading is the future. It's just there's there's some concerns now uh, and some obstacles that need to be overcome. Yeah, and you mentioned competition in the market, but unfortunately, uh, competition looks a lot like tariffs and bullets to most governments. That's true. That's true. Um, I, I guess I guess maybe the exception for the seasteads uh, when it comes to those governments is they were very, very. I mean, uh, I don't think there was a single one of them that uh, there was there were no taxes on any of them. Uh, so that that's a positive. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's very, very kind of libertarian based. But again, uh, the issue you know comes with governments. If you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So uh, I, I guess that that's that that is another concern too. But um, you know, at the same time, I, if I could go live out in the open ocean and not have to deal with, you know, all of the uh, all of the garbage that, uh, you know, governments, uh, you know, deal to us on a daily basis, then, uh, you know, I'll take my chances. Uh, you know, a lot, better oh, yeah, off, a lot better off out there than on land. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I really dig the idea. For sure. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it, it's it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Uh, you know, th yeah. things are technology is really changing things because, uh, you know, like I said, the technology for sea setting is all there. Electricity is not hard to come by. Uh, I interviewed uh, Chad Elwartowski, the chief technology officer for the Marinia project uh, on Friday, just, uh, just a couple of few days ago. And uh, he kind of, you know, laid out, uh, well, yeah, for internet and communications and, and things like that. It'll be, we have three phases. It'll be really easy to do, no problem. Uh, and then for electricity, there are a handful of options that could be used. Uh, so, I mean, the, the technology is all there. Uh, it really is. It'll just come to, uh, you know, kind of pop popularizing the idea and showing people that it actually is possible. Because uh, I, I was... You, you talk to some some average folk in the uh, in the state of serval society, and they really never thought of that as a possibility. So when you bring it up to them, uh, you know, it, it's not one of those things where it's like, what? That's crazy. That's never going to happen. It, it kind of piques people's interest. Uh, mm -hmm. So because I, 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 I think there's there's something 
uh, and I was I'll have to I have to talk to uh, somebody else uh, to talk to uh, uh, another guy from the Marinier Project about this. But I think there's I think there's just something within you know within you know individuals that kind of you know naturally draws them to the ocean. But I don't know I don't know I don't have any facts to prove that. But uh, I think people are just kind of intrigued by the open ocean. Oh yeah, man, I love it. I mean, I was raised in the mountains all my life, and I'm an Appalachian kid at heart. But you know, give me the chance and. And I love it. There's something about it. You're absolutely right. Um, but to the core, that is 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 the how, – how do I say this? But at the center of all that is is the want to and the drive to actually – to actually escape from dealing with with what people deal with every day, with what society has become, with what city living and you know outrageous taxes or or what have you. I mean, I mean, what it, whatever it is that drives people to something like a seastead, I imagine that's applicable for a few different other strategies, and I imagine that people haven't just been doing it since. Um, since seasteading's been a thing, right, right, yeah, and 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 yeah, you make a you make a very good point there. Yeah, the the, the folks that are pursuing these strategies, uh, you know, they they aren't they aren't staying, uh, you know, in the cities, and they aren't trying to fight the state through politics uh, or you know openly, you know, through through like uh, you know civil disobedience or uh, or even civil defiance. Uh, they're saying, you know, this, this you know the state of survival society is screwed up. Uh, I'm yeah. going to, you know, just go find my own freedom right now. Uh, but yeah, there, there, you know, the, the seasteading, you know, just, uh, you know, this wasn't kind of a recent thing. Like I mentioned, there were, you know, a few case studies in the 60s and 70s. And there was actually a, uh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, Vanu and Rayo. And uh, he was actually uh, uh, he was actually involved. One of the first projects he, he got involved with was something called the Fraals Project back in the early 60s. And uh, it was just a research, you know, re just a research project to see, you know, if it was possible to start a new libertarian country, uh, you know, on an uninhabited ocean island or, you know, uh, floating in the ocean somewhere. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, they worked for a few years on it to try to see if it was possible. But uh, the large majority of those folks, uh, you know, Rayo included, said, yeah, this is there's too many too many obstacles to overcome at this point. Uh, and they kind of shifted their focus to neo-nomadic living. Um, so, so let me talk about Rayo real quick because he's, he's a really, really interesting guy. So uh, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a really bustling libertarian community in Southern California. Uh, I know that's kind of strange to think about. Uh, <laughs> when you think about in 2017, yeah, it is yeah. strange to think about. <laughs> yeah, but you no, know, Southern California. I mean, you know, Sam Conkin was there for some time. I mean, kind of the the, the early right. thinkers uh, of libertarianism, kind of you know, all originated from from that Southern California. Not all of them, but but a lot of them. Um, so you know, Ray was one of those folks in Southern California, and like I said, he got involved with that Free Alice Project. He was heavily influenced by uh, the writings of Ayn Rand. Uh, he, you know, uh, attended the Nathaniel Brandon Institute for for some time, and uh, you know, he kind of just got sick of the all talk and, and no action portion of, of society then, and you know, it really hasn't changed much today. Uh, so he decided to move out of his apart move out of his move out of his apartment onto a camper mat on a pickup truck, and uh, he pursued uh, van nomadism, which uh, you know, it's it's pretty self explanatory, but uh, it's uh, where you you move frequently, you live in your van, and you move frequently. Uh, whether it's uh, public or private land, uh, you know, he, he stayed on both. And uh, he did that for a few years, and, you know, he, he liked it. You know, van nomadism was Rayo's thing. Um, but uh, you know, after a few years, he split time in the woods. Uh, he pursued something called wilderness fauna. Uh, so he actually lived in a polyethylene A tent for, for some parts of the year uh, in oh, the wow. Siskiyou region, northern California and southern Oregon. Uh, so... So yeah, he was in the mountains in a tent, you know, for at least some portion of the year, uh, which is, uh, you know, when I tell that story to people, it's like when I introduce to Vani like that, I always give a disclaimer like, okay, so this, this is what Rayo decided to do. There are a lot of other solutions because if you just kind of leave it at that, <laughs> a lot of folks will say, okay, come on, no, and I'm not gonna. Well, do I can do that for a weekend. Oh, same here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I could too. I could too, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This the wilderness money thing. There, there are other strategies that are more attractive to to me, and I, I think that'll be the, the interest for the folks that would be interested in that are going to be you know few and far between. Uh, so, yeah. so yeah, Rayo uh, you know pursued the wilderness money thing and wrote for a number of libertarian publications. Uh, throughout the 60s and 70s, Libertarian Connection, Vanu Life, uh, Preform, Inform, uh, just a bunch of publications, uh, and. Uh, you know, he continued doing what he was doing until, uh, you know, the last time anyone heard from him, which was 1974. 
Uh, and there was a letter he wrote to his editor, John Fisher, uh, the later editor of his book, John Fisher. Uh, and, uh, you know, he just disappeared. You know, he got to the people he was uh, he, he kind of talked about, you know, when he tried to work with others. Uh, you know, like the him and uh, him and his uh, freemates, uh, Roberta or Halen or whatever whatever name she's going by this week. Uh, she goes by different pseudonyms in different publications, which is strange. Um, or he had, you know, or he had, you know, like three women out there. Uh, but you tell me how easy it would be to convince, you know, multiple women to go live out in the woods. I'm thinking it was right. one person. Right. But uh, you know, he he talked about how, you know, they would they would uh, you know meet up with people, and uh, it would be like uh, if if you're dehydrated and you're drinking salt water, you know, it just kind of parches you. It's it does it's not uh, you know it's not uh, uh, satisfying. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess eventually he got kind of fed up with you know working with anybody in 1974 and just decided to uh, you know break off all communication. So uh, no one knows what happened to him afterwards. I, I guess kind of the the latest development that I that I that I kind of have, which has been corroborated from different sources, is uh, he kind of shifted from the polyethylene A-tent design uh, to fully underground structures. Um, so that's kind of where he ended. I don't know what he decided to do after that. Uh, you know, it's possible, you know, he one of his, uh, you know, uh, constructions fell in on him and he died. Uh, he might have gotten eaten by a bear. He might have returned to the status of all society after he got sick of that uh, or whatever it is. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, knowing Rayo and, and how he wrote about the status of all society, I highly doubt he went back to it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's that's all that's all anyone really knows of Rayo, but he was he was one of the ones uh, he was one of the main ones developing this uh, strategy called Vanu, uh, and to use that word again and not define it would be I think I need, need to do that first. But uh, Vanu is an awkward contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable, uh, so it's it's premised around becoming as invulnerable to coercion uh, as possible from both public coercers, which would be governments, and private coercers, criminals. Uh, so it's all just trying to become as invulnerable to coercion as you possibly uh, can. Uh, and that's kind of the, the main premise of Vanu. Uh, so I'll kind of stop there for a moment and, and see if you have anything. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I didn't want to jump in and interrupt you. You're on a roll. <laughs> I've, I've done that. Yeah, I've, I, I kind of have the... Uh, I've, I've done this, uh, this sort of introduction a lot, so... <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, going into the, the principle of, of Vanu being voluntary and n not vulnerable... At the same time, um, that's been around a long time, at least that way of thinking, and people haven't put words on it. Uh, where, I, where I grew up and still live in uh, southern Appalachia, we called those people moonshiners. We called those people outlaws. We called those people hillbillies. Right, right, yeah, and 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 I guess provide some back background on this. Why, why, why did Rayo and other, I guess, uh, Venuans decided to to create a brand new word? Uh, well, it's it's yeah. it's kind of it's you know uh, uh, obviously you could have used you know freedom or security, but those things mean different. Uh, I guess those words mean different things to different people. Uh, you right. talk to someone on the right about security, and they think you know military. You're like, oh, security. That's well, obviously you mean the military. Foreign right. policy, strong yeah. industrial complex, and the, and, and, yep. the, and the police officers. And you talk to someone on the left, and security to them is social security. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so that doesn't really match kind of uh, the, the libertarian perspective he was coming from. And he didn't want to, you know. As a lot of people, you know, do today, you know, trying to, I guess, you know, stop the reappropriation of those terms and, and back to kind of their roots. Uh, he didn't yeah. want to argue with people and, and try to, you know, try to, you know, um, I guess, restore the ac yeah, accurate meaning to it. So they just created their own word, uh, which which would have been Vanu. So uh, and I understand why he did that. I, I definitely understand why I did that. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of like the, the word capitalism today. Uh, oh, yeah. The, whether it's, you know, the right or the left, it's a very bastardized, uh, you know, definition of uh, capitalism. So I just tend to use the word free more like use just free market now, uh, free mm -hmm. market anarchist rather than anarcho capitalist, because that's uh, less, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, less problematic, uh, depending upon uh, who you're talking to. So I understand why I did it. Uh, but but one one one, I guess one comment I've gotten from uh, from folks who kind of, you know, just dabbling in, in Vani was, uh, you know, they create a lot of new words. So it's uh, and a lot of them aren't, uh, you know, very, uh, I guess <laughs> uh, the, some of them are very, very clunky. Uh, so you have to kind of learn a whole new language to uh, uh, to, to talk about Vani, but not really, not really. Uh, but they, yeah, they did create a lot of their own words. Yeah. When you, when you say clunky, you mean words like bludgy? Well, bludgy, not actually not that one. I, lo I love that word. Um, <laughs> I uh, know I've heard you say it a lot. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it's more so like uh, like collective movementism and controlled schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and import export the status of all society uh you know there are there are terms that describe those things today but uh to keep the podcast really genuine 
um, you know, I, I had we Kyle and I have to stick with, you know, those those original words that he used. So. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and you said right about the same time that that whole scene in Southern California was going on, that Konkin was a part of it. And I've heard that Konkin got a lot of his ideas from Rayo. Yeah, so this is this is what's kind of uh, what's what's kind of interesting. So um, there was an article Rayo wrote. Let me get that the actual year here in the book. Uh, but he wrote an, uh, an article titled uh, "Ethical uh, Self-Seeking Ethical Enclave Black Markets," and this was uh, written uh, from from the publication Innovator in November of 1965. Uh, so Ray or Konkin would have been 18 years old at that time. He would have been you know kind of fresh out of uh, out of high oh, school wow. if he went. Uh, yeah. So the uh, and I'll read this definition real quick and, and I'm not sure how familiar listeners are with agorism, um, but uh, I can I can define that too. But this was 1965 and this is uh, how Rayo defines uh, ethical enclaves. He said, "quote An ethical enclave is defined here as voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when such transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic of the participating individuals." An adherence to the ethical principle of voluntarism, the principle that no one should initiate violence or threat of violence against another. An enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. An ethical enclave is not necessarily a separate geographical entity. End quote. And then uh, in another portion, he actually describes kind of the starving the state aspect of agorism. So yeah, to, to compare here, agorism would be defined as a revolutionary market anarchist strategy that advocates the goal of bringing about a society in which all relations between people are voluntary exchanges by means of counter economics, which is black and gray market trading. That is trafficking in products and services which are either illegal or unregulated and untaxed, but not immoral or unethical. Yeah. Uh, so there, it's the exact same thing. So, so I had this uh, you know, kind of this hunch that, huh, what Konkin came up with sounds a whole hell of a lot like what uh, what Rayo kind of formulated. So, and these timelines look a little funky too. Yeah, and yeah, Konkin yeah. didn't start uh, didn't start talking about agorism until at least the early '70s. So even if it was, it, well, I don't even know if, if that was. I think he published. Uh, it was either a New Libertarian Manifesto or an Agorist Primer. It was published in like 1980. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, Rayo beat into the punch there. So, so what I had to find out was, all right, so. So we've got this this kind of timeline here, which would suggest that that Rayo kind of you know formulated this idea first. Uh, was Konkin even aware that Rayo existed? Well, actually, yeah, uh, he, he he was very well aware. He uh, wrote about Rayo and Vanu in a handful of uh, of articles in uh, 1974, I think it was. Uh, and uh, so yeah, Konkin was familiar with Rayo and what the Vanuans were doing. So uh, you know, I've I've kind of uh, you know I'm led to led to conclude that uh, you know Konkin. Had to have, you know, at least gotten some of his ideas for agorism uh, from uh, Rayo and, and his formulation of ethical enclave. So that's a piece of history. I mean, a lot of people know about Konkin and agorism, but uh, you know, not a, lot, not a lot of people know about Rayo. Uh, so, <laughs> so I was really excited to hear that because that, that's that, that's a way to draw an agorist to uh, to Devanu. Yeah, I don't know, man. I think I see a theme here. No matter what you want to call it, or and and I don't, I don't really blame Konkin for taking those ideas and putting a different word on it. It seems like in language dealing with the general population every day, we have to rephrase something because something has a connotation to it. He may just have been trying to keep ahead of the pace, so to speak. But but I, I, I think there's a trend, and I think this is a very long-running trend. I, I think that in every society, in every generation – there's something that that drives people to just want to not necessarily exit society, but not really be as controlled and and constrained. And I mean, it, it goes. All, I mean, you could probably go all the way back to Bible days. You could go back to history since it was the beginning of written. History. I think it was uh, – was it a Professor Scott who wrote The Art of Not Being Governed? Yes, yes, and I actually did watch that lecture today. I want to make one, one note real quick on, on why – uh, you know, Konkin, uh, you know, utilized some of those ideas and, and came up with sure. uh, with this this uh, with a concept like a concept with a different name. Uh, and, and the reason is uh, ethical enclaves are just an option that Venuans can pursue. Uh, whereas if you if you call yourself an agorist and you aren't practicing agorism, if you aren't trading in the black and gray markets, then you are an agorist. Uh, so uh, 
so for for ethical enclaves for the new ones that's a potential option but for for agorist uh trading in the black and gray markets is a requirement uh or you aren't an agorist uh so uh so, but yeah I, I actually did watch uh, uh the, a lecture that he gave uh, uh professor james scott uh, on his book the art of not being governed so yeah he's, he's kind of talking about how there were a bunch of tribes in uh upland southeast asia uh, that were essentially stateless societies for some, some for over some 2,000 years. Uh, and I actually found a really, and this was actually really pretty immediate uh, when he started talking about it, but uh, apparently a lot of these, uh, a lot of the occupants of, Zom of Zomia, that's what's their name for, for the area that the, the professors yeah. and the researchers, you know, kind of penned it as, uh, they found out that, you know, the occupants of Zomia were nomadic foragers, uh, much like, uh, you know, Rayo's Wilderness Fauna. Uh, and, uh, you know, he also mentioned that uh, the way that they, you know, kind of evaded the state and stayed outside of its purview uh, was because they valued, you know, mobility. They were nomads. They moved all the time. Uh, they moved mm -hmm. constantly. And that's something that Rayo talked about uh, extensively. That's why he chose, you know, van nomadism and uh, wilderness vanu uh, with multiple. Uh, he had multiple, you know, camp spots. Uh, so if one of them were to become found, he could always go to a different one. And uh, he had different ones for different purposes. So uh, the idea of mobility was huge to Rayo, and it sounds like the, the individuals at uh, Zomia were doing the same exact thing, and that's how they kind of kept their stateless society. Uh, so that was a really interesting uh, parallel, I guess you could say. Uh, and then one other note, and this is just kind of uh, one that I, I, was, I appreciated that he, he made this point, but uh, James Scott said that, uh, uh, you know, walls aren't used to keep people out. Uh, they're used and built to keep the taxpayers in. Uh, yeah. So I just like that. I mean, you know, all the constant border debates, it seems, that are going on in libertarian circles right now. Uh, I just appreciated hearing him say that because I think a lot of uh, a lot of people are, uh, you know, forgetting about uh, some important pieces of history uh, when it comes to, to those sorts of things. So, uh, I, I mean, I haven't read the book, but I did watch that uh, watch that lecture uh, where he kind of explained the, the society and, and where they were at. And uh, I, some interesting parallels with Rayo and Vanu. So. Uh, I, I, th I think, uh, you know, if they've been stateless for over 2,000 years and, uh, you know, Ray was able to, uh, you know, increase his personal freedom or his invulnerability to coercion uh, using these strategies, I think the efficacy of this uh, mobility uh, is kind of proven. Yeah, and I believe that you can go back into multiple societies through history, and, and if you dig deep enough, it, if you dig deep enough and it's not edited out – You'll find, like the Irish, um, I believe if you, if if we had the records of, like Mayans and Incans, I'm sure all of them weren't ruled by the king of their city or whatever. You know, there was a lot of trading going on there, and I'm, it there it. It has to be the case that some of them were nomadic, and it has to be the case that some of them pretty much lived as free as they wanted to. And I think that happened on a wide scale from that time and is still going on today. And I believe that spirit is alive and well in ideas like agorism, in ideas like Vanu. Right, right, and 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 early on, uh, you know, most of like, yeah, early on, you know, early human history, uh, the the tribes had to be nomadic, uh, at least to some extent, because they would, uh, you know, they would their, uh, you know, their animals would, you know, uh, eat up all the grass. They'd have to move, uh, you know, yeah. they they they'd hunt the game down to a point where you know that they, you know, the game wasn't wasn't really there anymore. Uh, so so with I guess that pre-industrial time, uh, kind of that uh, pre-technological. Uh, they kind of had to be nomadic. They had to move around to find new resources. So uh, go, go I, I, with the seasons, yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, uh, maybe you know, kind of feudal England, or maybe even a little before that. Uh, I, I would say, you know, up until and this, this is, uh, I don't have any specific, you know, references here, but I would say, like, I, I would, I would, you know, make the claim that uh, it's it, probably, you know, 50% of human history has been kind of that nomadic living. Uh, until kind of the uh, until maybe you know kind of feudal Europe I, I would guess but um, I would yeah I would definitely imagine there were a lot of a lot of uh, you know tribes and societies that that were nomadic early on uh, kind of because they had to be uh, I, I would say so and you've pretty much subscribed to the theory that uh, what'd you call it neo nomadism yeah neo neo nomadic living yeah neo nomadic living um, have you become convinced that that's one of the best ways to actually put more liberty in your life and regain more control over 
your life, what you do, your property and your surroundings? Yeah, I, I yeah I am convinced that uh, you know mobility or temporary autonomous zones are more efficacious than permanent autonomous zones. Not to say that there are uh, but there are some strategies for for permanent autonomous zones, passes, uh, which which could work. Uh, but uh, one you know one thing I or I guess one reason why I think Ray really focused on mobility was. Uh, you know, due to the fact that uh, if, if you don't have a permanent fixed location, the state doesn't know where to look for you. And if you're constantly moving, it'll be very, very hard for them to find you if they, you know, wanted to find you at all. Uh, sure. So that's that. So that is one thing. There are some counter arguments, sure, like for van nomadism, uh, you do have to have, uh, you know, the slave tax, as, as he called them, the uh, license and registration, all of that. You got to abide by the laws. Uh, so you, you, you do have run-ins with bludgies, unfortunately, because you are on the so-called public roads. Um, but uh, but generally speaking, yeah, the, the temporary autonomous zones, you know, that mobility uh, is is absolutely crucial. Um, for example, you know, with, whether it's a minimal sailboating, van nomadism, wilderness fauna, or uh, something, I guess, newer. Rayo called it country shopping back in the 60s, but uh, there's something called perpetual traveling today. Uh, yeah. Uh, I interviewed a guy named uh, Pete Cisco for on Liberty Under Attack, uh, the beginning of the direct action series, and. Um, he was, uh, you know, he's been doing that for, for since, you know, 2000 or something along those lines. And he, him and his wife live out of suitcases. Uh, they have like one suitcase each and they just move around. Uh, uh, they, they have their the countries they like to go to and uh, they, they stay in those countries as long as they can, as long as the country will allow. And then they just, you know, move. Yeah, uh, the, inter yeah. the Internet's covered up with travel bloggers and YouTubers and, and everybody just jet set, man. Yes, yes. And, and, and that's... Uh, uh, so, so I, I would I would agree to to some extent like if, if if we were back in like the 1960s or 70s and technology wasn't where it is today, uh, yeah I would be it would be difficult to uh, you know to put some of these things into action. Uh, it definitely would be. Uh, but with you know technology the way it is now, uh, these lifestyles are you know very very possible. Uh, and uh, you know whether it's uh, van nomadism or minimal sailboating, you can still have those amenities that you have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at home. I mean, you know, there's uh, if, if you go on uh, YouTube, whether it's uh, van dwelling is what the more common term is today, uh, van dwelling or you know live up people who live aboard their boats, uh, you can find hundreds upon thousands of examples of uh, people you know putting up those vlogs on on their experiences. Uh, so. Yeah, technology is is, is absolutely absolutely uh, you know you, you know uh, helped out with that. Uh, hell, people are uh, you know they they have you know Patreon blogs or I guess Patreon pages, uh, and uh, you know they just uh, you know post videos and stuff, and that's how they make their money you know to to keep uh, sailing, as uh, yeah. you know from from Patreon and donations and things. So uh, it's really really incredible. Uh, you know the the possibilities that technology has opened up, especially in, uh, in, in kind of these realms and probably financial independence more specifically, uh, where, you know, uh, telecommuting uh, is, uh, you know, a really common thing now and freelancing uh, and things like that. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely huge. I love it. I love the idea that these guys can just pull into a port, find an Internet connection, um, schedule a bunch of uh, – schedule a – bunch of publications or maybe not publications but but separate posts to publish right and i mean it's kind of like podcasting i imagine you know you you can set it to upload it to your host you can set it to publish at a certain day a certain time and they just these things will keep rolling out automatically while they're exactly. in the wind sailing east or whatever and and man they have got it figured out and i would I'd imagine that would add a lot of autonomy and a lot of liberty into your life and <clears throat> I'm kind of jealous of them how how comfortable they all seem and 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 how free and not really caring and worrying so much about the car note or about how the kids doing in public school or what the neighbor thinks of them or or who the, or who the president or their congressman's going to be or what that that doesn't matter because yeah. if they're going to be you know sailing around full time or if they're going to be uh you know country shopping or expatriating or uh, you know, living in a van. Uh, the only thing that, the only thing is I could really help someone, you know, that's a van nomad, uh, would be, uh, you know, less restrictions on, you know, travel, which that's not, it's, you know, no, no president or congressman or anybody's even going to touch that, <laughs> uh, with a thousand foot pole. So there's no, they have no, they have no reason to be interested in politics and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe as a hobby, but, uh, you know, that, that doesn't affect their life. Uh, when I interviewed Pete, yeah. Cis I mentioned Pete Cisco and he said that's, um, 
you know, uh, he's only in the countries for like less than three months typically. So he doesn't even understand the structure of the government or, or whatever, like th those things. So there's like, there's, 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 there's no reason for him to care about what's going on in those countries. He's going to be there so short, like he's going to be there for, you know, a couple months, a couple few months. Uh, yeah. so I think that's, that, that'd be one of the most freeing things because you, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you're well aware of kind of the political climate now, uh, and how, uh, you know, people are kind of getting up in a, uh, in, in a dizzy, a tizzy or whatever that word is. Uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty chaotic. It's pretty chaotic. It takes up a lot of time, money, effort, and, uh, you know, uh, I guess overtly fighting the state like that, uh, or, you know, fighting, uh, your supposed enemies, uh, yeah. whether, you know, Antifa or alt-right or whatever that, the, you know, their supposed enemies, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of, uh, you know, they, they may get tossed in, in, in jail too. So, um, I think that's one of the major, you know, attractions and, and something I could really, you know, be beneficial for people, uh, you know, to really, you know, seek out their own personal freedom is, is by one of these, you know, mobile lifestyles where, you know, it, it doesn't do them any good to care about politics. Yeah. And I'd, I'd say you kind of drift further and further and further away from that influence. If like you were saying, you were only in port or in a country or really soaking that society in for two or three months at a time. And I imagine that that would also kind of tie in with the import export idea that, uh, Rayo had, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, let me go ahead and define these, uh, I'll have to find that term cause that's probably brand new to some folks here. Yeah. Not like the tariffed up taxed up, uh, import export. Everything's from China thing that we're all used to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's yeah, that's that's different than what uh, what Ray was talking about. Much yes. different. <laughs> yep. So so import export uh, uh, could be defined as a one directional isolation that is used to maintain access to these servile societies, open but not free trading centers, and denying them access to uh, Vonnie home uh, through importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the servile society. So the idea here is. So you have your Vanu home base, uh, the place where you're most invulnerable to coercion, whether that's a sailboat, a polyethylene A-10, uh, a tiny home, uh, a van, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you have your, your Vanu home base where you're, you're most invulnerable to coercion, and uh, the import-export is used uh, to, again, import goods and knowledge from the servile society uh, while exporting labor products back out to it. So the idea here is that you have a partition uh, between those two things, whereas most folks... Uh, you know, that live in the cities, they're completely consumed by uh, the state of servile society. And uh, one of the, I guess, the the advantages of, uh, I guess, that Rayo found out was um, when they got really good at their food storage, and actually, you know, Rayo and, and the Venuans uh, uh, pioneered the pioneered survivalism, um, by the way. Um, but once they got their I food, their food storage, set, uh, their food storage uh, set up uh, going, and uh, all of those things, they didn't have to return to you know the status of all society uh, for you know three, six, seven months at a time. So you know the the less uh, it, the less times you, the, I guess the less interaction you have with the state of servile society, the more invulnerable to coercion that you are, because what are, what, you know, what's, what consists, uh, or what makes up the state of servile society? Well, you know, uh, uh, governments, uh, you know, the, 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 mm -hmm. you know, the primary coercers, uh, if you're in a place like Chicago or Detroit, uh, you have your private criminals, uh, that you have to deal with. Uh, so yeah, the, the less interaction you have with the state of servile society is best. Uh, but Rayo did, you know, warn against, uh, primitivism, uh, you yeah. know, becoming completely self-sufficient, never having any interaction with, you know, the state of survival society. Uh, and the reason for that is if you don't know, if you don't know your enemy and uh, the technologies they have, uh, then you can't, uh, you know, fight them, avoid them, you know, deceive them, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so I guess one example that he, or I guess one example that Kyle and I use pretty, pretty often is, so if you're a primitive tribe that's been, uh, you know, out there in, you know, the middle of the woods for a hundred, hundred, hundred years, um, and, I guess your your progeny has no idea, you know, what technologies, you know, exist in the state of survival society and a drone flies overhead. They would have no idea what that is. They'd have no idea whatsoever. And I'm guessing they probably panic. Uh, right. But it would actually it would actually make you more vulnerable to coercion uh, because you wouldn't know what to avoid. Uh, Hell, I know what it is and I'd still panic. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But if you had no idea whatsoever, um, I mean, oh, it would be completely foreign. Yeah. 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 Yeah, definitely. So from the from the partition of import export, where can we go from there? 
I guess we could we could discuss kind of the because one thing that's unique about Vanu and uh, like we did that direct action series uh, on Liberty Under Attack Radio, which is a six month long, six plus month long series uh, on direct action. Uh, and, and it is true that uh, you know the strategies that Rayo proposes for Vanu uh, and the strategies that uh, you know could work for Vanu, uh, they are direct action. But what's unique about Vanu is there's this coherent philosophy, philosophy behind it. You know, these people mm-hmm. didn't make these radical lifestyle changes just because they wanted to. Uh, there was a really, you know, firm philosophical backing, and uh, they knew what they were out there trying to avoid. So, um, okay. so there's, a, a, there's a, I guess, section one of Rayo's book is the, philo- I guess, the theory, and section two is the practice, and that's following the search for personal freedom. And if your listeners want to uh, pick up a free uh, copy of a PDF or an audiobook for that, uh, they can go to vonnypodcast.com, and uh, there at the top of the top left of the page, you'll see free Vonny book. Just click there, and uh, you can uh, read or listen to the entire thing. And actually, um, in the next uh, week or two, this is being recorded on August 21st, I uh, should have Vonny Life 1973, March 1973, um, the digitized version out uh, for uh, for the public. I've been awesome. working on that for, for the past month or so, and that's actually an original libertarian publication uh, from you know 1973 so there's a lot of really uh, incredible stuff in there uh so uh so yeah keep a look out for that too because uh yeah if i've read the ent- oh I, I i did i transcribed the entire thing so eighty thousand plus words dude so, you worked you worked too much you've got probably. everything going on <laughs> probably yeah yeah and, I, mean, <laughs> I mean don't get me wrong don't get me wrong i know i and many others appreciate the shit out of it <laughs> yeah, and I guess one one thing I Definitely. didn't mention is I yeah so I, I have Liberty Under Attack Publications too, which is a um, an audiobook and you know uh, an audiobook and, and and book publishing company. Uh, it's all you know free PDFs and anthologies and uh, audiobooks and such. Uh, so pretty constantly I'm, I'm digitizing a book. I've I've digitized a lot of um, a lot of uh, a lot of books. So the transcribing takes up some time, but it's it's pretty easy. It's it's easy work. Um, but anyways, anyways. Uh, um, so the the the, philo- the coherent philosophy behind Vonu. So there were three concepts that that Rayo kind of laid out in his book: political crusading plus controlled schizophrenia plus collective movementism equals the servile society. So political crusading, pretty self-explanatory uh, strategy to restore liberty by working inside of the system in order to change it from within. Uh, the uh, next one, controlled schizophrenia, which uh, is the mental state of, of an op- opportunistic citizen serf within the servile society. He practices double think yet who still acts in his own best interest. Political crusaders are but just one example of this in action. Um, so that would be one of the uh, most common examples that I'll use is, uh, uh, you know, anarchist politicians. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, controlled schizophrenia there. Uh, yeah. Rayo related it more so to, he only used the term once in the book, but he r- related it to your normal person in the, you know, state of survival society who, uh, you know, tries to uh, utilize as many tax, holes, uh, tax loopholes as he can, um, he goes to college instead of uh, he goes to college so he can avoid being uh, conscripted to war, uh, as this was back around the time of Vietnam. Um, just th- things like that, things like that, mm-hmm. where where the uh, um, very very hypocritical in, in, in their in their approach to life. Uh, some aspects of it are, are very good, like uh, you know with anarchist politicians, you know they they, they understand anarchism, but uh, there's just something something wrong there where uh, <laughs> where you know you you have a uh, an atheist uh, you know trying to become a priest. Uh, it's kind of uh, you know one of one of the examples that, that I that I use. Um, so so political crusading plus controlled schizophrenia plus collective movementism and collective movementism is an aggregate set of behaviors and actions that are aimed towards large scale socio political change and the furtherance of specific goals. So uh, you know relevant example you know the uh, the uh, so called alt right and uh, the anti antifa folks. Uh, I've heard collective, of them. Collective yeah. movementism. That's what that is. And collective movementism has been one of the most dangerous phenomenon throughout history uh you consider socialism communism fascism all of these things that have led to really terrible results it's all been a result of collective movementism political and political crusading and i think the reason that a lot of folks even kind of anarchist libertarians are still uh you know dabbling those things is because there's uh you know uh, a little bit of controlled schizophrenia there and uh rayo did say and this was a fantastic uh, quote he said, yeah, so Rayo said, quote, one can forget about the herd and become free once he exorcises the collectivist spooks from his head, end quote. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot, there's uh, definitely a lot of work that needs to be done, uh, you know, even in anarchist libertarian circles about, uh, you know, exorcising yeah. that collectivist spook. Um, 
It's unfortunate. I mean, there's there's plenty of empirical evidence to prove that uh, polit- political crusading doesn't bring about increased freedom uh, or increased yeah. invulnerability to coercion. Uh, it just doesn't. It just doesn't. It actually typically has the, the counter effect where, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rayo mentioned elsewhere, uh, to paraphrase him, that a lot of the, the terrible things that, that uh, you know, we've gotten used to today, uh, like with Social Security and, um, and uh, you know, uh, just was what, whatever example you want to what, want to bring up. They've they, they've typically been results of you know political crusades of the past. Uh, so yeah, oh, yeah. It typically schools, has schools, you know, welfare, e- any war we've gotten into. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so we we had the uh, political political crusading plus controlled schizophrenia plus collective movementism, uh, and that equals the servile society. I've said that word a lot, should have defined it by now, but let's go ahead and do that. Uh, it's a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. In other words, it upholds the collective as superior to the individual. Um, so the, the the important part here is that the servile society is the main foe uh, of the Venuan. And to bring import-export back up, that's why import-export is so important, because it explains the relationship between Venuans and the state of servile society. So... It's a very, you know, the, the way that he kind of, you know, laid that out in his book, and Kyle, Kyle and I had, had to kind of piece that together, but it's very, very, it's a very, you know, coherent, you know, backing to to, to Vani. It really explains why, you know, the, the way that Venuans, and I, I tend to agree with them on most everything, uh, except they were they were menarchists, unfortunately. Uh, Rayo had some really uh, petty things to say about anarchism, but I think it just because he didn't, didn't understand what the hell it was. Um, but uh, <laughs> right, and it's suffered so much abuse of language over the years. Depending on who you're talking to, it could be a completely different thing, man. Right, it, right, and you consider the 60s and 70s. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, Rothbard's yeah. entire, you know, uh, collection of work wasn't wasn't available. Uh, Rothbard's probably still kind of early in the circle in the 60s. I would, I would guess. I'm not, I'm not for sure on that. Um, yeah, but, he was still, he was still bitching about Rand at that point, wasn't he? But, yeah, that's, that that sounds right. Yeah, that's yeah, that sounds it's about right. the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so they didn't like each other. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I think they did. Or what? Actually, no, I don't think they did. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they did. Um, so yeah, I I just don't think you know the the anarchist uh, it, and actually you know kind of the the Americans I guess the American threat of anarchism kind of brought about something new, which is kind of the proprietarian anarchism. Because uh, traditionally, you know, over in Europe, it, it has typically been kind of the cynicalist variety, the communistic variety. Right. Um, so that's what, uh, you know, that's what I think most of them saw anarchism as, uh, is kind of that uh, really terrible thing. You know, these were individualists, and they saw, you know, anarchism as being this collectivist thing, um, where, you know, now, uh, kind of in, in, in American, in so-called American tradition, I guess you could say, um, there's a propertarian uh, variety of that. Uh, so I don't think that really... It wasn't really fleshed out uh, then, I don't think. And the majority of folks, yeah. uh, you know, even the educational outlets, um, they they were minarchists, and you know, they kind of believed in the free market. But um, again, maybe a little bit of controlled schizophrenia. They still advocated for some for government to do some things. So, um, so yeah, anarchism. I guess the the way it is now in America is a little different. Um, back, I guess their their perceptions of it back then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he did he did use the word voluntarism, and you know, he he was. He was going in the right direction. Yeah, uh, he he definitely was, and I think if he would have, um, yeah, and when you when you read it, when you read his book and, and all the things he had to say about uh, you know governments and uh, and and you know the society that's kind of uh, that that's uh, you know fosters the environment for for you know a government to you know uh, come into fruition or for it to expand. And uh, yeah, he sounds like an anarchist. He really does. I just think it was kind of a yeah. flawed interpretation. Uh, and. Yeah, even even you know them being uh, kind of minarchists, uh, you know, kind of that that limited night watchman state. They're a whole hell of a lot better than a lot of the anarchists I run into on a daily basis that are you know oh, advocating yeah. for politicians and uh, these these uh, grand collectivist schemes or even some of the ones I'm, I'm not going to get in, in, into it. But uh, but yeah, even like the the minar- they were very very consistent. Yeah, you know they yeah. used the term voluntarism, and uh, and he was uh, you know in favor of trading in the black and gray markets. You know, hence the ethical enclaves. Uh, so, you know, he sounded like an anarchist. He really did. Um, so I, I think if, uh, you know, if I, if I could call him up on Skype today and kind of explain anarchism to him, I think he'd call himself an anarchist, but, uh, yeah. he'd, he'd be well, about 80, I, he'd be about 80 years old now. 70, like, yeah, probably in his eighties in his eighties. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of believe that a lot of people, um, I wouldn't say are vulnerable to or fall victim to, but. There's a hurdle, man. A lot of people get it all figured out. And when they have to 
come face to face with it and actually put a name to it, it's a scary name that's been abused for ever. Oh gosh, yeah. And yeah. And, and and when it comes to that, they're like, well, you know, someone would need to protect this geographical location, so I guess we've got to have something. But it, it, they jive with everything else. Like, yeah, I guess tax is theft. Like, yeah, I guess you shouldn't be thrown in a cage for smoking a plant. Or, yeah, you know, you should keep all the fruits of your labor. But for some reason, when they're firing on all cylinders, they get to the finish line and just stall. But, you know, I, I suspect that, I mean, if some of the smartest minds in academia and business and name it – can come to all these conclusions and be just there but can't admit to themselves because that's what I think it really is that anarchy is not a bad word that yeah. voluntarism is not a bad word yeah that and I, I, I think also I think also too uh, and this is one of the major motivations for uh, a project I did for Liberty under attack back uh, it's the first first edition was out in 20 end of 2015 but the freedom umbrella of direct action. Uh, that was a you know kind of a direct response because, you know I, I've had conversations with with you know friends and family members about it and uh, it, it's just kind of well it, oh there will never be an anarchist society Shane uh, there there just won't be so this this isn't practical uh, this isn't practical now what is practical is uh, you know I can participate in politics and you know change the system as much as I can by my you know, change the system as much as I can and get with others that can that can do it too so I think the the it's 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 kind of it's it's a perception. It's a perception. People still pe people still have the still believe in the notion that, uh, you know, okay, you know, the, the government the government sucks. It's too big. Okay, yeah, but we yeah. can still we can still reel it back some through politics, and and that's pretty much that's pretty much all that we can do. Well, um, that's that's one thing that they can talk about, and and that's fine if they want to do that. I'm sure I can take advantage of it somehow. All right, that that's cool. You know, I I can work with that. Um, but that's not exactly what you and I are talking about as the changing society and doing away with government um, completely, like in general and as a whole. Like that's not my goal. That's not possible for me to do. That's not possible for Shane to do. What is possible for us to do as individuals is find ways to maybe gain a little bit more individually for ourselves and tell other people that that's possible as well. Right, right. And that, and that's, that's, that's the approach that, that, that I take now. It was probably, probably the first year I was an anarchist. Uh, you know, I was, I was a little naive. I was a little naive as I think, uh, yeah. as I think, as I think a lot of people uh, kind of tend to be when that, when they come to anarchism, because I, I, you know, I found so many anarchists online within the first few months, and within within you know the first four or five months, I was at my first anarchist freedom festival. Uh, so like the the perception was, oh my gosh, there are a lot of anarchists. Like the incapacitation may come into fruition, uh, but uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, I my or I guess not unfortunately, but my position has changed. I don't think there will ever be an incapacitation. I think there will always be a state of surveillance society. Uh, there will there will always be those uh, the, those folks who. Uh, you know, for some reason, uh, well, well, actually, I, I guess the, one of the major reasons people can benefit from government, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, subsidies, welfare, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, people kind of use the government as their own, uh, as their own, uh, uh, as their own, uh, you know, bullying tool, I guess. So, so yeah, I, I guess, I, I guess that, that, that comes into play as well. But I, I don't know, I, I think it really just comes down to, uh, and this is with, uh, you know, uh, and this is with, uh, with with you know some of the anarchists who kind of you know participate in kind of these grand collectivist schemes is that if they would, I, I wish I, I wish people would be more selfish because uh, you know an empty cup can't fill another. If you're not free, then it's going to be you know why would anyone listen to you? Why you know do, do you have really have anything to offer? Exactly. Um, so I, I really wish people would be more sh more selfish. And if we're going to talk, you know, if I'm going to speak their language, you know, these grand collectivist schemes. Okay, okay, so. If everyone, you know, start focusing on themselves and, you know, maybe they start utilizing strategies that Ray proposed, maybe, you know, uh, van, nomadism, van nomadism, intentional communities, which there are actually a couple of those co uh, coming up in the next couple of few years, which will be interesting. Um, you know, people, you know, utilize that and really increase their personal freedom. Uh, and, you know, it kind of started to pick up. I mean, van dwelling and, you know, living aboard a sailboat already kind of is. Uh, it's, it's pretty popular now. 
Uh, you know, yeah. people just withdrew from withdrew from the state of survival society to the extent that they could. Um, I think that would be that would be huge, and that would have far more of an effect than trying to get five percent of the vote for the liberta- for the anti libertarian libertarian party. Um, so I, I think it kind of comes down to that too. Um, I wish people would be more selfish. And you'd, you'd think, you know, uh, anarcho capitalists could be more selfish, but uh, it's always about trying to, you know, uh, save the statist, uh, yeah. you know, for, to save them from their own sins. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, there's kind of a place for that, pointing out contradictions and things. But, um, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, I only have one life to live, and I'm not going to, you know, uh, waste it. Uh, you know, waiting for other people to, you know, come to the philosophy so that incapacity can, can come into fruition. Um, I, I prefer strategies where I can pick it. I, I can I can do it myself tomorrow and not have to wait on anybody. Um, yeah. You know, the there's plenty of empirical evidence to show that political crusading doesn't actually, you know, increase personal freedom. But, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't know what it is. It's it's insanity. People, you know, trying the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Um, so I, I don't really know what the symptom is, you know, what the what the cause for that is. But I would I would hedge my bets that Ray was kind of correct uh, to control schizophrenia thing in action. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, voting in general, voting in general isn't conducive to liberty at all, because to to vote your preference to make your preference more comfortable is more than likely in today's climate or any climate where you voted democratically for a leader is going to hinder someone else's freedom because it's one side against the other. Neither one of them care about freedom. Neither one of them care about principles. They care about preference and what they think should be imposed on others. Now, I know that sounds a little extreme what what they think as their preferences they want to impose on others but i mean if you if you get down to it candidates run on marriage between a man and a woman or what plants you can legally have or where immigrants can travel where they can work where they can live right. it's always Putting restrictions on someone so their voter base can be more comfortable, so they can enjoy their preferences. But no one has the principle to actually get out, do something, and lead by example. You know, I think Jordan Peterson said it best. You're not going to be able to do shit if you can't clean your own room. Yep. Yep, that is a very, very good point. And what's what's even – I guess what's even worse about this too – is that the majority of the, the majority of voting that people focus on is every four years in the presidential election, uh, and and this is uh, I did an episode for Liberty Under Attack. It was November of 2016. It was you know well timed. Um, uh, yeah, this is the most frustrating part. So people get all like you know the, the major drama and all of that uh, comes from presidential elections. And what's what's really really you know is it it's funny, but it's it's frustrating too. Is that uh, you know uh, <laughs> you voting in the presidential election has no effect whatsoever unless you're an elector, unless you're one of those uh, you know 10, 15, 20 electors right. in that state. So I mean the popular vote is completely irrelevant. And when, and what's even worse about this too is the you know the the left the the, the uh, people that you know wanted Hillary, Hillary uh, Clinton to get into office, uh, you know they even acknowledge this. They said you know the the uh, the electoral college is racist. Uh, you know that she got the popular vote. Why isn't she president? <laughs> and it's like, okay, so you're acknowledging the fact that your vote had nothing to like your vote had nothing to do with who was selected as president. Okay, you've acknowledged yes, that. Yes, and so, magically. So are you are you going yeah, to go vote again in four years for a president? Probably. So so all probably. of the stuff surrounding presidential elections, political parties, um, uh, political parties, uh, the uh, um, the uh, presidential debates, the the entertainment. Because uh, it doesn't matter what, what what direction they sway the average voter, it makes no difference at all. They all the only people they have to speak to are the electors. So this yeah. all of this um, all this nonsense about uh, uh, <laughs> you know uh, um, you know presidential debates, you know uh, um, getting to know the candidates so you can you know uh, you know vote better. Uh, yeah, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you don't have any direct impact on on who is elected president. Anyways, that's the electors. Yeah. Yeah, but for some magical reason, because I didn't vote, now I guess I don't have a right to bitch about it. <laughs> oh, that it, isn't that what isn't that what they say? Yeah, 
Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it is. And, and, you know, the, the kind of the, the easy counter argument to that is, well, you, uh, uh, you know, you participate in the system and you already consented to the outcome. Uh, whereas, you know, I didn't participate in the system uh, and therefore I'm not responsible for, for what, uh, you know, what either what, what either of the candidates does uh, when they uh, when they get in their uh, in their in, in office. Um, Your that, response that was, is much more polite than mine. <laughs> oh, trust me. When it when it comes to when it comes to political crusading, I get pretty. I get that's that's kind of the one thing I have no patience for anymore. Like anarchist politicians <laughs> and things. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have any patience for it whatsoever because the main driver for the Freedom Umbrella yeah. Direct Action was is it was you know it was you know kind of the year before the election, so God, that stuff was kind of in the works. And, uh, you know, even when I was a minarchist, I still didn't vote. I voted in one election in 2012 and canceled my voter registration after that. But uh, when I told people that, they're like, well, if I don't vote, then what can I do? So the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action. Uh, I think uh, at this uh, third edition, there's like 90 plus, you know, things you can do other than voting. Some are more minor and more yeah. philosophical, like canceling the voter registration. You're not going to, you know, have drastically increased freedom by doing that, but you're cutting a tie to the state. Uh, it's in the st uh, strategic withdrawal section. Um, so then there are, you know, other ones that have, you know, wide ranging, you know, uh, benefits, uh, some are lifestyle changes, you know, such as Vanu. Uh, so I mean, there are a lot of things people can do, uh, in their own personal lives. So the, the, the only excuse left is, uh, you know, that they have no principles, you know, whether it's anarchists or libertarians, that they have no principles and therefore they're going to participate in politics. Uh, or, you know, they just, I don't know. They're just dis they're just disingenuous, and they, they really don't care about their personal freedom. They just uh, you know, like the game of politics. I, I don't know. Uh, it's it's uh, kind of hard to uh, you know psych psychoanalyze uh, uh, you know all the uh, uh, <laughs> the political crusaders. But uh, yeah, it's frustrating. That was yeah. the main driver for the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, and then uh, the Direct Action series, which came after that, where we just interview people who've done all of these things. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that's I don't have any patience for that anymore, man. Just don't. Whenever someone says that to me, I just copy and paste the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, call it a day, and just move on. Unfollow, un unfollow the post, and turn off the turn off notifications. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 like you see people spinning their wheels, and it's not just that they're spinning their wheels; they're not being productive, and it's not just that they're not being productive; they're actually moving backwards and wasting not only their time but yours. And I don't know about you; I ain't got a whole lot of time for that. No, no, I yeah, I don't have time to debate someone on the merits of voting anymore. I've already done, uh, you know, enough episodes on that in the podcast. I've written, you know, enough articles on the subject. Uh, it's done. So if someone says you view my arguments against voting, they can go do that. I'm not gonna, you know, make the same points, you know, time and time again. Uh, that's why that's why I make the content. So I can just paste a link. It's it's uh, you know, yeah. it's, uh, you know, saves a lot of time. Saves a lot of time. Um, but yeah, you know, Rayo, Rayo's all these things. I mean, when it, when it comes to politics, Rayo was spot on. Uh, with, with with all of these things, you know, pointing out uh, all of the uh, the blatant contradictions and the the hypocrisies within within people's minds, uh, and then additionally, just uh, you know, understanding the dangers uh, and and the realities of uh, like collective collective movementism. Because uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm sure there are you know some you know some organizations where when when they when they're launched, you know, they may have really 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 good intentions. Like okay, I agree with everything they're trying to do. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's inevitable. I mean, the organization has to grow. They have to recruit new members. And mm -hmm. uh, to do that, you have to widen your base. That's what politicians do. There's a lot of do. stuff that will hinder the execution of it too, man. Yes, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's definitely true. That's definitely true. I th but uh, that, that, like, that, I, th I think it's a really good thing that Ron Paul didn't get anywhere close to winning, because if he would have won, he would have disappointed everyone that followed him, just because he wouldn't have been able to do shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that, and that's that's another thing too. Uh, you know, people you know place so much faith in the presidential election, but the president really doesn't do that much. Um, you know, it's 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 the uh, it's it's the uh, fourth branch of government, uh, the administrative agencies that that, that judge, jury, and executioner. Um, yeah. They they're the ones that's uh, you know the the ones that, that the unelected bureaucrats. They're the ones that are putting forth a lot of like the most tyrannical stuff. Uh, it's not really the president. Now, sure, they can sign executive orders, um, but the the president doesn't have that much power. Uh, well, okay, that's that's not the, the president does have a lot of power, but um, most of the visible uh, most of the visible tyranny um, that's uh, you know is inflicted upon us on a daily basis uh, is from the, the from the fourth branch of government, the administrative agencies. So, uh, sure. So that that's kind of a factor too. Yeah, I just assume forget all that, man. I've got Bitcoin to make, and I'm sure you got to buy a sailboat. 
Yeah, either yeah, sailboat or, or a van, sailboat or a van, or I, I guess a, it, what my my main plan now is uh, we've got land in southern Illinois. Uh, it's you know wilderness area, uh, and uh, just go go homestead out there. You know I, I'll I'll still have uh, still have to utilize some legal loopholes, some legal interstices as Rayo called them. Um, but uh, you know I, I think you know even just that one step. Like I, I live in a city of. 50,000 people and it's right next to another town with another 50,000 people. So 100,000 people in, the, in, in this town and the neighboring town to, to all together. I, I think one of the one of the most significant and easiest moves, because this is something people are already do, people are already doing, you know, kind of moving from the suburbs to rural areas. Um, mm -hmm. That can in increase your invulnerability to coercion quite a bit uh, if you're outside of the city. Um, now there are obviously some, argu some arguments made against it, but uh, as one, you know, very, very, you know, step that people are already doing uh it's not one of these things like yeah go live in a polyethylene in the woods have fun bud uh it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little more realistic than um to, to most folks than that so a lot of gray man mentality going on there i would assume gray man oh are you familiar with the gray man uh not extremely familiar but en enough to know i need to read more because it's absolutely intriguing yeah yes oh yeah yeah i de definitely a lot of the gray man in there and, and with 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 vanu i mean they're, they're a lot of that's a lot of that stuff involved when it comes to like security culture and things. I mean, Rayo was uh, uh, obviously that's not his real name. He did initially go with his real name's Tom Marshall, uh, but he switched to a pseudonym later on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he was deep into the security culture stuff. I mean, he was talking about end -end, uh, end end encryption uh, over I think it was over ham radios. So Kyle and I kind of uh, Kyle and my co-host on the Vonnie podcast. So we what we kind of deduce it down to because. Um, it's frustrating. My, what, what I'm trying to do now is I, I digitize the entire Vonnie Live publication. It's going through some proofreader, proofreaders now to fix my screw-ups. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to acquire as many of those as possible because all we have all we have so far is there are a few articles on the Internet mentioning Rayo and Vonnie. And then there's uh, this, this one book, uh, which is like 100 pages. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of information. Uh, there, there, there's, there's really not. So I'm, I'm trying to get access to as many of those publications as possible. I'm in contact with... Some pretty, you know, historical people uh, in the libertarian community, uh, <laughs> which is which has been fun, and, and they're working on getting the publications for me. But um, yeah, it's kind of hard to know uh, exactly what they did, uh, you know, after you know 1974, and and, that, and the, the conversations that happen in these publications are just fascinating. Uh, they really yeah. are. Um, so so not not only kind of those those interesting strategies, but I mean, uh, um, it was the the book was published under a publishing company called Lumpanics Unlimited. And they published some really fringe stuff. Um, like uh, Erwin Strauss wrote a book for Loon Panics called Basement, uh, Basement Nukes. And he pretty much talked about <laughs> – it, it was like it was pretty hardcore stuff. They got they had an FBI file and everything. Oh, um, wow. But, uh, you know, like uh, it's obviously like uh, there's a bunch of stuff on, you know, tax evasion and, uh, you know, falsifying identification and, uh, and paper tripping and just all sorts of stuff that's uh, uh, illegal as all hell. Um, oh, yeah. so it's, 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 it's great stuff. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather read about that than some, uh, uh, than, you know, some politicians, uh, t than one of, uh, Dolan J. Tramp's tweets, uh, yeah. or something along those lines. So there, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, there really is. And, uh, one thing that Kyle and I have to do where we, we've, we've, we've gotten done with season one of the Vonnie podcast. Uh, we're in se uh, season one was the theory, uh, all the philo philosophical stuff, uh, you know, the uh, season two is uh, the practice of Vani, which is section two of Rayo's book, where we're kind of just laying out what Rayo had to say and we'll kind of discuss it. And then season three is where we actually develop these things. Because uh, something that Rayo said was, uh, I'm paraphrasing again, uh, what was Vani 50 years ago may not be Vani today, and what's uh, Vani today may not be Vani 50 years from now. Um, so it's uh, very much focused on reality. And, uh, you know, technologies governments have available to them, uh, or the technologies coercers have available to them change. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, some strategies may, uh, you know, become uh, easier to Vanu, uh, you know, now, uh, or they may not be uh, compared to, you know, 50 years ago. So uh, it's very much focused on uh, on reality uh, and, and the way things are rather than how, uh, you know, the political crusaders want them to be uh, when they lobby for, uh, you know, uh, a law to get re repealed or something along those lines. Yeah, well, now that it's... Yeah, now that it's been easier for us to come together and communicate and learn from one another and help one another and do business with one another, and now we have what I call Internet 2.0, the blockchain, which makes mm -hmm. it more private, more secure, more 
mesh networky. It's it's it makes me smile. I love it. Um, lots to look forward to, but I do see that same spirit with innovation. It's still the same spirit with technology. It's still the same spirit with whatever term you want to put on it. The not governed, right? The the agorist, uh, Vanu. Um, Vin Armani I had on a couple episodes ago has coined a term called crypto savage, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and we may need to keep calling it different stuff because, you know. Keep the, public... keep, keep, keep the bludgies confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, they need it because everything good in the vocabulary, they destroy. Yeah, or they, yeah, they, or they, yeah, they, they definitely attempt to destroy it. Uh, I mean, that's that's uh, with with Ross Ulbricht. That's why he got handed down two yeah. life sentences plus fifty years. Is you know, uh, uh, you know, Judge whatever her name was. Uh, I don't remember. I don't remember her name off offhand. Uh, yeah. You know, she was trying to make a statement like, hey, if you guys do this, then uh, then yeah, you're you're going to get screwed. You're going to get screwed. But they, I mean, you know, governments can't governments can't stop it. I mean, they're just getting around. Uh, now, New York State was a little quicker, but they're just now kind of getting to, you know, some regulations and some enforcement on Bitcoin. And that's been out for like eight years. It took them like eight years to catch up on that. Good um, luck. So and, and then now by the time they're catching with Bitcoin, there's, you know, the crypto notes uh, protocols. So you have like uh, Monero where actually anonymous transactions like uh, yeah. uh, so they're, they're, they're struggling to catch up. And, uh, you know, with with all of these open source technologies uh, coming out, uh I've said it before and I'll say it again. You know, I, I really do think it's going to be the developers and programmers that really, uh, you know, drive forward the possibility for personal freedom. Uh, I really do and, and create kind of that second realm where we don't have to use the infrastructure of the state to serve all society. We'll have our own infrastructure. We'll have mesh networks. We'll have our own, you know, financial, yeah, I guess, uh, unsystem might be a better way to put it, of, you yeah. know, a free market and cryptocurrencies or gold or silver, or whatever people decide to trade with. Um, and rather than trying to change, you know, society as a whole, rather than, yeah, rather, rather than try to change society as a whole, um, and in order to influence government or get rid of it, uh, you know, we'll just create our own stuff, our own infrastructure. Yeah. And, and when uh, we do that, when we do that, and when Shane and Kyle benefit from being so selfish, helping one another, it's going to show other people that it's possible they can do it too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and yeah. And it, and yeah, the, the whole selfish thing, I mean, uh, I mean, you could say it was selfish, but there are benefits for society as a whole, too. So for, for those folks oh, who, yeah. who kind of have that mentality, I mean, if, if the, the less money that's, uh, you know, for, for Agora's more ethical enclaves, the less money you're giving to the state, the less money they have to spend on wars and enforcement and all of that. And obviously, there's an argument to I, I don't think there's a way to starve the state right now because obviously, you know, the, the fiat currency. Um, yeah. That's it. when they can print their own money at will. Uh, that kind of complicates things, um, and that's fine because they're going to do that. They've been doing that. We know that's what they do. Fine, dandy. They can go do that way over there and leave me the hell alone. Um, but I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something that benefits me. I'm going to do something that enriches the life of my family. And others are going to benefit from that. Transactions in the marketplace, man. Others are going to benefit from the fruits of my labor. Others are going to benefit if I can keep more of the fruits of my labor and use it as I see fit. I believe Bastiat would agree with me. There's much more value to be added in the marketplace. There's much more value to bolster the market. There's much more value to produce new things that, that not only make me a little cash, but enriches everyone's quality of life in the process. Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah definitely. If, if, uh, you know, if a business, uh, can save, save a lot of money on taxes and hire another employee, I mean, that's, uh, uh, that has, uh, you know, a far, far greater benefit than, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, tossing, uh, or I guess not even tossing, having uh, money stolen from you to go to a third party, yeah. uh, and then have it, uh, you know, uh, uh, looted and then, uh, you know, redistributed back out to to the populace at large. Uh, so yeah, you know, I, I I I definitely agree. Even even with uh, kind of that selfish approach, work on your own freedom first. Uh, you know, you know that still benefits uh, everyone. Uh, it really does. So you can you can be selfish and then also have kind of that. I uh, I don't like the word too much, but like the altruistic kind of attitude uh, behind it too. Uh, you know, the less money the state has to work with, uh, the less coercion they can, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
infect society with. Uh, and you know, the the if you if you're saving money, if if you're not paying taxes or you're uh, you know evading taxes, uh, then that uh, leaves more money in your pocket to develop uh, technologies or a product or a service uh, that benefits uh, that benefits uh, you know somebody else. So uh, yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah, yeah. Let you and I use up all the resources so they can't buy ammunition for all them big fucking guns they got. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good line to end on. Shit. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. I like that.